Welcome everyone to the Success Elevated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Hayden Lee, and I'm joined by another host today, Mr. Derek Priest. He's going to help me interview a really special guest, Jeremy Reitz, founder of Reitz Drying Academy. Jeremy, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thank you, Hayden. I appreciate it. And I, I tell you, I, I'm honored to have Derek here because... Uh... I, but I don't know if that means that he's nervous about what I'm going to say and he's going to try to <laughs> wrangle me a little bit or whatever. But I have a feeling, Hayden, between Derek and I, you're going to have a big challenge on your hands keeping this thing under control. That, I'm just, a little bit like herding cats predict, today. Early but, prediction. Yeah, I just we'll, really, uh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure yeah. it out. Derek, thank you as well for joining to help me interview uh, Jeremy a little bit. It's my pleasure. I just, I just hope if nothing else happens from this podcast that – the whole world knows the real story about Jeremy Reitz's success, that I was the one who made him rich. So it really um, stems from years and years ago when he was inventing this stuff, trying to sell it, and he conned me into buying all this equipment, and the rest has been, been just a a windfall of awesome for Jeremy. So it, it is because of me. Well, I do have a lot of your money, but I've also <laughs> given you a lot of my money back. So um, I don't know how it works out, but maybe we'll get the calculator out at uh, next All right. Crowd, who's in the lead, but I think you probably owe me a <laughs> somewhere. No, Jeremy is a really good friend of mine. We have known each other for a long, long time. Um, I'm super excited to be able to help um, host this today and and to rapid fire some awesome questions at Jeremy and to 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 hear hear his experience and his his knowledge shared with uh, your with the listeners today Hayden so thanks for having me yeah no problem well um, Jeremy let's I want to dive right in um, you know we were talking a little bit before we started recording about um, relating your experience back to business owners and entrepreneurs and all that. And I think ultimately that's the goal for me in any podcast, but especially this podcast, I think you have a lot of industry specific knowledge that I think is going to help a lot of restoration and cleaning owners, but also just business and entrepreneurs in general, right? That uh, they don't necessarily have to be in the industry. Um, but I, I want to start, Jeremy, with your background. How did you get involved in the cleaning and restoration industry? And how did that maybe kind of start pushing you towards this idea of education and, and training others in the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my background is my parents started a company in 1970, which uh, was in the cleaning and cleaning industry, essentially. And we also cleaning, did yep. some water damage stuff, but there was no restoration industry in 1970. Uh, but in the mid eighties, we start, found that we were doing quite a bit of water damage work um, just because people would have water damages and we had a big truck mounted vacuum. And so you sucked up the water and it evolved from there. So I, I did my first water damage December 24th, 1988. I know exactly where it was. I remember the, the, uh, customer's name Kathleen and I won't tell you her last name because you'll you know there'd be people probably flocking to her house to meet her but um, I remember who the adjuster was it was an it was a state farm adjuster um, it was a duplex water came from overhead from a freeze and uh, I loved it I mean I fell in love with water damage on that that first job right there and um and uh, that, so that's really where I got started. I, I went on the truck starting in 1990 and um, did a variety of things. I, I, but I, I was riding the truck for 12 years. In 2002, I took over our family business operation. And, um, you know, just, I think the education and the equipment and so forth all came out of adapting to change in our industry. Because as I mentioned, there was no, restoration industry in 1970. And when you have these young industries like this, I mean, we're still really, maybe still we could call ourselves in an adolescence phase, but things change rapidly in, in a young industry like this. And that's what we've seen. Um, so there was this um, you know, critical window of time back in the early 2000s that a lot of change was coming out. Uh, I was 
really interested in being a part of that. And so, you know, in amongst all the other things that I was doing, I would spend uh, time um, doing research and then testing. I actually had a little workbench outside my office and I would set up um, drying uh, uh, experiments on a small scale and I could just watch them during the course of the day while I was doing my other stuff and I would record uh, record what was happening and so forth and it was just taking that stuff and working it out that kind of that was what helped me develop that so it was really an effort to develop my own business in in a different way and 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 uh, it turned into uh, developing equipment and education so really really cool I, I think you hit you hit the nail on the head when you talk about adapting to change um, I'm fairly you know, I, I worked for a restoration company a couple of years ago for a summer, but I'm still fairly new to the industry when I, especially when I'm talking to you guys, you, you really, you're both very, very old. And, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, just, Wait. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Just I'm Derek. Derek, I'm not yeah, Derek. Old. Derek is super, super old. Uh, anyways, <laughs> but you both have been in the industry, uh, for much longer than me. Um, but it's been fascinating to learn how close knit the industry is. And I think that's, in large part because of what you mentioned, Jeremy, that the industry is still young. Um, people are, there's, when you look at how many companies there are in the U.S., it might feel like a lot, but, but really it's, it, we're still in a fairly new industry and people are, are learning new things every day. And, and it seems like there's crazy, crazy growth, especially when I, you know, talk to certain business owners and um, adapting to change is so critical for not only companies in a new industry, but just any business or entrepreneur in general, um, how, how how can someone be better at adapting to change? What are what are some things that they need to look for? Is, is it maybe some soft skills they need to develop within themselves? How can someone be better at adapting to change? That is a huge question. Um, it's actually, you know, we're not talking about it yet, but yeah. the whole next level event is all about. And I know you weren't leading in, but I- No, I, no, no. I mean, perfect took, lead in though. Took the question. <laughs> it's all about that exact question. So we spent two days on talking about how to deal with change. So there's two problems. First of all, entrepreneurs love change. We're enamored with change. Anything new and flashy and shiny, we're all over it. So, so it's not that we have a problem adapting. It's that we have a problem staying on track, right? Because- as soon as you start changing, you start drifting. And if you don't remember why you came to the party in the, be in the beginning, you're, you're going to be way off in left field, you know, doing stuff, crazy stuff, starting marketing companies, um, all kind of stuff, <laughs> you know, just starting education businesses. I mean, it, right. it, that happens. So I think that um, one of the principles that we have to stay focused on is keeping things simple. As you make a, make changes, um, keep yourself focused. Um, it, it, once you spread yourself too thin, uh, you're even a great deal of effort of wor and working on your business. It's only going to have so much impact because not only do you have to work on this, but now you have to work on that and you have to work over here. And, and you just kind of are giving these bit your business or even the strategy or or whatnot behind your business, just a touch, as opposed to deep diving into some of the uh, specifics in what you do. So, so coming back to change, um, I think that if I could sum it all up in, in a, a couple of statements, it's focus on exactly what you make money doing, and then figure out a simpler way to get there. If you can do those two things, then you're making changes for the right reasons. That's that's awesome. Those those two Great things advice. I think uh, apply to every can can apply to any aspect of your life, really. Uh, Derek, he kind of hint at he hinted at uh, you know a, a big chunk of of what you've been doing here at Spot On Solutions. But and if, if listeners will remember when we had you on, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we talked about that thing that you know, you were a, a clean, you owned a cleaning and restoration company and eventually transitioned into, help, you know, doing marketing for cleaning and restoration companies. And that's a huge change. <laughs> um, how, how have you found maybe to kind of piggyback off of what Jeremy's been saying, how have you found the best ways to adapt to change, to, to change who you are and change your business model and, 
as, as the years have gone by with spot on solutions? Well, I think to kind of piggyback off of what Jeremy said, that you got to keep an eye out for, for change. Like the one thing that is a constant in business and in life is change. I mean, and the moment that we just get stagnant and we do the same thing today because we've always done this and, and, you know, it works and we're not going to ever pivot is the, the time when you're going to potentially, you know, going to start going backwards. Um, we live in a world that is fraught with change and that's what you have to be looking at what what's happening in the world around you and how are we going to change and how are we going to adapt to the, to those changes i love from jeremy's point of view and J- jeremy's perspective how he has always looked at the future right he's always looked at what's happening and how do we adapt what we're doing to to meet the needs of the future restoration businesses or the rest of the future business owners. I mean, I remember when I first met Jeremy, he was, you know, he was still somewhat in the restoration business. His family still uh, owned the business, but he was getting into the education side of things. You'd built, you know, the flood house, right? But then he was like, instead of just having people come here, which is in, you know, Georgia of all places, which is fantastic for the people on, you know, the other side of Mississippi, but what about the people clear across the country? Um, He found a way to make it to, to get his product, his service, his training out into the hands of technicians in the field and to do that for a business owner. I I remember like the very first, like, 100, 150 videos that you put out about water damage restoration for technicians. And I was probably one, I, I, I feel like I was one of those first customers because I was like, we live in Idaho and I can't send all my technicians to Atlanta, Georgia. And so this was, it was perfect. And we implemented that. And then he's continued to find ways to adapt, to bring that to bring that message to more and more people at a more affordable rate. So, and that's, that's the one thing that I've always admired about you, Jeremy, is how you've been visionary enough to see what's coming and how do we, how do you adjust to, uh, to meet the needs of, of the people who are changing of those changes. So Hayden, I, I would like to just interject one thing here with regard to Derek being an early uh, Reads TV subscriber. <clears throat> the only feedback I've gotten from Derek prior to this was burn the red shirt and we hate the music. That's the only feedback. That's the only feedback I got in 15 years. And so, anyway, this is nice to hear. I just, I, I hope we were recording this. <laughs> but hey, we'll, that we'll make sure to shirt. cut up that clip. Derek will have a little promo for you or something, right? <laughs> no, I, uh, that's, but really, add, well, oh, sorry, I want to add, add something because what Derek said is really important. I, I truthfully, um, with regard to change and, and to your question, here's the hard thing about change. Change is slow and gradual, right? So we rarely see these major jumps in how things are done in an industry. However, step back and look at large gaps in time and see how you would handle it. And you realize, wow, we've, if we don't change, we will die, right? So let's go back to 1995. Uh, your parents probably were still in school, Hayden. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> they- I was born uh, in 94, <laughs> Jeremy, come on. <laughs> so what were we talking like 11th grade? Maybe they, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oh, geez. I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how to do that math, but anyway, 1995, <laughs> this is, that's not the point. Um, back then it would not have been uncommon for you to uh, hand write a mitigation estimate. It's, it was still possible yeah. to do that and take it to an agent's office and get a check for a mitigation job or a fire cleanup. That was possible. They would just, 
you know, glad, you know, how so glad to see you leave some business cards so we can send you some more work. Here's a check. And we were using for, for water damage. We, we had um, really some poor, we were probably starting to use some hygrometers. We had standard refrigerant dehumidifiers. We had air movers that pulled eight to 12 amps a piece. And <laughs> Um, programs were just getting started. The Crawford Contractor Connection, for example, was still the PRISM network. And we got work all the work you could handle for 3% and there was no review. I mean, so that's one time period. S you know, let's snap forward to um, today and look at how technology has changed. Uh, look at how <clears throat> estimating has changed, reviews have changed, programs have changed. Um, if you made no changes between that time period, uh, how how would your business fare? It would be awful, right? You, you would not be profitable at all. You'd be out of business. Yeah. So we recognize there's a need for change, but the important thing is anticipating, like David said, or David, Derek said, anticipating what's next and trying to stay ahead of that change curve. So instead of constantly being caught kind of in the wash you're 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 ahead of that cycle now you can't always be there um, but that takes thought which again goes back to this point of you've got to be focused and you got to keep things simple otherwise all you're doing is trying to manage uh, a, a, an unmanageable organization and set of processes yeah this this so this is a, a transition that i i, I want to make and it's not really a transition because it's still going to be talking about change but from the outside looking in, you know, I don't, I don't own a business. Both of you have owned businesses um, or, or in our current, currently owning businesses, but um, you know, Derek and, and, and you, Jeremy have both mentioned anticipating change and, and how you react to it and all this stuff. I feel like anticipating change there's again, outside looking in. So please correct me if I'm wrong. There's a little bit of anticipation that has to happen. You have to kind of there are probably instances where you look at the world, you're saying, okay, I think everybody's going to do this. And you take a leap and there's probably some failure that happens um, where you say, I think everyone's going to do this next. And this is what we need to do. And that doesn't work out. Have there been some instances like that, Jeremy? Am I, am I talking out of turn? Or have there been some instances like that? And how have you reacted to, or, and rebounded maybe is a better word, from some of those failures of, of trying to anticipate, oh, I think everyone's going to do this, or I think this is going to be big next. How, how have you, you know, rebounded from, from those mistakes, I guess, or missteps? Uh, I've never had that happen, but you could yeah, ask. I figured, yeah, okay. <laughs> no. If anybody's made mistakes, I can, no. I can, I've got a list about as long as, well, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Remember how long those are? It's yeah. A, it's, it's a pretty long list, so. Wow, I'll take your word but, for it. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, if you're not making, if you're not, if you're not uh, making mistakes, you're not trying, you're not, you're not being, I, I would say not being aggressive enough. Now, you need to calculate the cost of that, right? I mean, you don't just throw caution to the wind and just hope for the best. You want to, you want to try to uh, use the, the data you have to go based on what I'm seeing. I think this is what will happen next. Um, but but sometimes for us, it's uh, for me, I can say um, certain examples, uh, getting into something that I thought would be a good diversification or a good product for uh, or my restoration company or my education company and realizing, yeah, that was a mistake. Well, it, it's, that's fine. You know, make your mistakes. That happens sometimes, but learn from them. And then you got to move on, man. It just, uh, sometimes you have to just, you have to, uh, you know, suck it up. You know, you, you made a, you made an error. Um, but if you, if you, if you're constantly looking back at those errors and uh, you, you're never going to, you're never going to have success moving forward. You got to go, okay, I see what I did wrong there. I'm not going to make that mistake again. And you can use it as a learning lesson. But we don't drive a car looking out the back window. We've got to we got to look ahead to what's next, reanticipate, um, and uh, and move ahead. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, you do make mistakes, and that's that's part of the deal. 
hundred percent that, that hits it right on the head. Derek, you, you've got the, the list as long as the dead sea scrolls, like you said, how have, uh, how have you rebounded from mistakes? Well, <laughs> like, like Jeremy said, you just have to, you make your mistakes, you accept them, you figure Hey, this didn't work. And then you gotta, you gotta let them go and you gotta move forward. I bet you, but you move forward. Number one, understanding what you, what didn't work and now, and, and abandon the, the, what didn't work and move forward with something that hopefully will work. But that being said, um, I think you can, as we look forward, we have to learn, we have to look back and learn. We can learn from the events and the things that have happened in the past as well too. And that is, is, I think, a question that, I know it's been on my mind and it's been something that I have been considering. Um, And I got to assume, knowing Jeremy, that he's been looking at this as well too, Jeremy. But in the, in the, I'm not, I'm not bringing up any kind of a political statement or anything like that, but it is apparent that our econ- we're going through some struggles in our economy um, and we're the things that are happening in our economy now potentially could get worse, could get better, um, may get worse before they get better. But as you, as you're looking ahead based off of what the state of our potential econ- our economy is now and potentially where it's going um what would you are are you looking at potentially thing you know events of the past and how those are they gonna quote repeat themselves or or how do we how do we handle what's what's ahead based off of maybe what's uh what we've experienced in the past does that make sense yeah i mean we've got uh do we have a repeat of 2008 coming up i it's hard to say you know but but without a doubt like you're mentioning um, we're already seeing some challenges in the economy and look for the last 10 years, anybody could run a business, right? You know, it, it's not that, well, not anybody, but anyway, it's a lot, it's been a lot easier. <laughs> you could, uh, you could fall into it and make, uh, make a living. But, um, a lot of people came to, uh, the restoration industry because they saw it as recession resistant. Um, I, I know people who to this day, you know, were in, um, construction or something related to that and totally got burned and just were like, I am never going to build my business back like that. I'm never going to get back into that and so forth. Um, so, you know, they're trying to anticipate that. But for us, what what is it really going to mean in the restoration industry? Well, again, hard to say exactly, but I will tell you what happened in 2008. Uh, for the most part, um, the amount of business we were doing did not change much at all. Um, people still had water damages, people still had fires, people still had mold, and people still needed to get those things cared for. Uh, some of the challenges we did face were, uh, you know, people not turning over the money. That That's a real thing. And they're sitting there looking at a stack of bills and they're holding a check for $8,000 and it's gone. You know, that happens. That mm-hmm. That is something that you uh, want to put, start thinking now about how would I how can I deal with that going forward into the future? Another thing that happened um, was that uh, we saw a lot of people leaving industries that were majorly impacted, like the construction industry, and transitioning into the restoration industry. Uh, they left. Once things got going again in construction, they went back to their their uh, primary skill set. Mm-hmm. And uh, I will anticipate that this time they'll come back, back much more quickly and there will be more people coming into our industry as well. So is that a concern? Sure it is. Sure it is. But right now, hopefully we've got the high ground. If you're already in the industry, hopefully you've got processes, you've got relationships, you've got employees and you hold that high ground. You, you really are taking, uh, you got a strong position in the market. And you can use this time right now to solidify relationships, 
um, to and, and to make sure that you continue to have a business coming in. Diversify how you have your business, your your leads coming in. Get better at closing leads, sales, sales. Your your conversion rate or your closing ratio uh, is a real good point of focus for you. If it's if it's shaky, tighten it up now. Get a process in place while you can, because now you you may you know you're you're surviving with what you've got. Uh, but make it work really, really well. So as you start to see some sag in certain areas of your uh, business from a margin or, or revenue standpoint, uh, you're ready for it. You can, you can, uh, you can manage that because you, you're, you're running on all cylinders in other areas. Um, I, I think that there's also some very positive things that come. Well, I shouldn't say it that way. That sounds bad. Let me rephrase <laughs> that. There's there's some things that are not altogether bad from a business owner's perspective, which uh, there tends to tends to be easier to find people to work. Um, it, it it's uh, it's an opportunity for uh, you to bring in some really um, good uh, employees, great teammates to into your organization. So looking at that opportunity is is valuable as well. But I think that if in addition to that. Um, when you when you have what you consider to be good margins right now, you tend to get a little bit loose with the money, and you're spending money that you really shouldn't be spending, and you're you're not tightening up on. I think about mitigation uh, all the time, water damage restoration all the time. It, your your estimates are not super tight. Your process, you're missing stuff. You're not calculating equipment, um, and you get away with it. Tighten right. It up right now. Get those, you, I, I, I am certain that if you spend the time uh, focusing on that, you can increase your margin by several points. Now, that's great anytime. Sure. But actually coming into this, it's kind of like going, you know, hey, it's about to rain. We don't freak out and, you know, panic. No, that's the wrong thing. Just bring things in out of the rain and, and we'll be all right. It's going to be fine. But taking some of those actions right now, uh, we'll have you better prepared for whatever comes. What potentially comes. That's great advice. Love, I love that. That, awesome. that. that analogy makes a ton of sense, Jeremy. And you just hit on it just really quick there at the end. Um, I think a lot of times when people go through hard times with their business, and again, this is outside looking in, so take it for what it's worth, but I think people try to stop the rain. And um, you can't do that. You can't, I mean, it, it, that's impossible. You're never going to stop the rain, right? There are, some, there are some factors when it comes to maybe a recession or whatever it might be that are outside your control. You can't control those things. But what you can do is bring your stuff in out of the rain, right? You can control what you can control, your, your sphere of influence. Um, I had a, a teacher in, in high school that, that talked about that a lot. Like focus on what you can control and, and don't worry about everything else. The, you know, narrow down what you, what you know, you can actually have an influence over and work on those things. And, uh, and, and I think that'll help you be best prepared for, for, you know, maybe a worst case scenario, things like that when it comes to a recession or whatever it might be. So that's a great analogy. And I, I wanted to just make sure I highlighted that right there at the end, but um, with, with all of these things that have gone on, especially, you know, I think in large part, this, uh, this downturn that might be happening currently and, and maybe over the next year or so, I think in large part is probably due to what we've experienced the last couple of years with, with the pandemic and everything that's gone on. Um, Jeremy, REITS TV and, and REITS Drying Academy has been doing virtual training for a long, long time. And it's, it's kind of been the theme of what we've talked about adapting to change and always being focused on change and, and things like that. But um, you guys have been doing it long before zoom or virtual or remote work was even a thing. Why did you start offering that? Why was that? Why did you feel like that was something that you needed to offer and how can that relate to, you know, other business owners when it comes to, you know, not everyone's in the education or training business, but, how can they be aware of, of, of specific things or how can they train their team better through the remote space? I'll answer that as two separate questions. So okay. first I'll tell you um, uh, about virtual training and just a little, a little, a little uh, 
learning um, theory or whatever, education. Okay. Um, and then we'll go into how what we did, why I actually did what I did with Reads TV and how you might be able to apply that in your business. Because it, there's these principles apply across the board. Yep. So just we'll start with the education theory. So, um, so one of the principles with regard to education at our school that um, defines what type of classes we're going to teach and, um, and, you know, what our area is to try to keep ourselves focused so we're not producing a class on, you know, how to uh, generate new sources of income. Oh, I got my, uh, let me lower my hand. It just saw my hand go up and it automatically put it on. <laughs> but um, I don't have another statement. Um, but uh, it is that that our classes are designed to help you to know how to get paid for the job you should do. So if we're going to do a class, it's either to help you to see what the right type of job is, according to standards and so forth, and help you become technically better at what you're doing, uh, and or they're about how to get paid for that in the industry that we work in. So that's always what our classes are going to be about. Um, and so it helps keep us focused. And that's important. Um, education theory, uh, bring that in and, and, and um, help you to see how what's why go to virtual classes or online training that's self-paced like videos and so forth versus going to a hands-on class well um virtual and uh and self-paced it's a matter of convenience and uh, you can sit down anytime any day in your own home and uh, take self-paced training, or you can stay at home and attend at a certain time a virtual training where the instructor is in one location or another. We go over, we we do it over Zoom. So it's really it comes down to a convenience factor. Uh, but what all adults need uh, in training is they need two pieces. They need to be shown um, what to do. They need to be told what to do. So that's part of the training. That's the lecture piece of it. Uh, but they also need to be able to practice it so that then they can apply it. If you don't have that practice piece in there, uh, you're going to miss the value of training. So I'll give you an example we can all relate to. You've gone and uh, uh, you're trying to fix something and you've gone on Google and Googled, how do I fix this? And a YouTube video yep. pops and boom, it shows you exactly how to repair it. And it's like, sweet, you put your phone away and then you go to try to do it. And you realize, wow, there's gaps I, I, I miss. I did not, wait a second. You pull that back out and you push play and you, you see one step and then you do that step. And then you push play and do step two and then you do that, right? And, and, and that's because we need to be able to practice what we're learning in order to really be able to understand it. Now, if you had three more of those to repair one after the other, you could go fix it, fix the second one, fix the third one. <clears throat> the fourth one and boom now you you've got competency well with training the the same thing is true uh if you're going to do virtual then you need to employers or or whomever is in is, is taking charge of the training in your company needs to then put you in a position to utilize that training right away right away sooner the better and don't get the training and then uh not allow them to utilize it or not be able to make decisions with that information because they'll lose it um, so that's why a lot of people like to come to our facility and do hands-on training, because what we're going to do is we're going to, we have the lecture and then we have hands-on associated with everything that you learn. You're going to learn it. Then you're going to do it. You're going to learn it. Then you're going to do it. In fact, we have a manual and a workbook. Uh, you don't just have a, a student manual. That's, that's just the show me, tell me part. Yep. We have a workbook where you're actually using that, doing that and, and putting it to good use. So, so there's, there's your in a, in a nutshell, what you need in, in order to make either type of training work. Now, why, now we'll go to your second question. Why did I do what I did with REITS TV? Well, and how could you use that information? So what I realized is that I only have so much time. And uh, we all recognize that, right? So we're all, we come, become acutely aware of that when we have no work or we're just getting started in a business, we got all the time we take on all these different things. Oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. Cause I, you know, if I can make $1 better than no dollar, right? So that's the way we think about it. And that's the way you scratch something out of the dirt. 
However, you've got to make a transition because you're going to recognize that very quickly, if you're at all good at what you do, you no longer have any time. Yet you haven't reached the goals that you need to get to. So everything hinges off of your availability. So you have to find ways to continually leverage yourself, leverage what you know. As you're doing something, you should be thinking, am I the best person to do this? Now, you know, we might go, of course I am. I'm the best at everything. <laughs> something Sounds like something Derek would say. That's but, exactly what I say. <laughs> but, but ask a different question. Go, am I the only one who could do this? Because if you're the only person that can do it, carry on. And if and yet, if you're the only person that can do it right now because someone else needs some training to be able to take it off your hands, then train them. Stop. It's going to take a little extra time for you to go, let me show you how to do this, because then next time you can do it. Right. Boom. Great. Now you're you're you you have opened up some time for yourself. And what you want to eventually do it. And you've got to know this from the beginning. What are the things that only I can do? And ultimately, you want to shed everything else and focus your time into that. If I could do one thing in my business that would have the most impact, what would it be? And then spend your time doing that. And that's how the most successful people, you see people that have these businesses that are amazing. I mean, you're like, what? how in the world are they doing that? Because what they've done is they've delegated well, they've trained well. And they've shed all of the unnecessary tasks that they took on early and focused in on what's most important. That is a key thing. So when, when we came to Reese TV, I recognized, look, uh, there's only 52 weeks in a year. And there's only one of me. And um, some people, I guess, don't have cars like Idaho um, and can't get to my location. I mean, that's, that's something Derek was saying earlier. Yeah, I, I, yep. I, I've never, no, I have been to Idaho. Uh, but anyway, no, there's, seriously. They, it, cars, are, cars are few and far between in Idaho, for sure, Jeremy. <laughs> it's hard no, to ride a horse all the way to Georgia. It would yeah. be, Jeremy. That yeah. would be. So, but, but the point is, I, I looked at it and go, well, why don't we, we record this? And then it can be replicated. Now, that doesn't fix, fix everyone's issue, but it can leverage what I'm doing so that I don't have to be there yep. and um, allows me to work on, on running my business. And that, that just taking that principle out of, uh, out of my business and uh, my education business, I put it also into my restoration business, business because my brothers and I also own a restoration company. Uh, it's the same one that my parents started, and um, I, I, they do the majority of the, the hands-on work. I, I don't, um, and that was our agreement. Um, and I focus on just what I do, which is I, I focus on helping our our company to be more profitable. And I, I just consult. I don't actually do. So um, that's my role, and it doesn't take a lot of time. And the, and my brothers do a great job of of making it all happen. And, and not that they don't know what to do there. It's just right. that that's my role. So anyway, you can do that and, and you have to do that in your organization. You have to step back and reevaluate because things have changed since last year. And if your role hasn't, you're, you've, fallen, you've fallen behind. Your role should constantly be, you should constantly be training and delegating. If you're not, you're, 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 uh, you're going to, you're going to be um, frozen in time. Yeah. I, great, great advice. I, I think you've, you've hit something on the head there, Jeremy, that I want to make sure that I, that I like drive it home for people. It seems like, again, I don't, I don't own a business, but I've, I've been interviewing people and, and I work with a lot of business owners, um, you know, helping them with their marketing. It seems almost almost all of the time with almost any person that I've talked to that's owned a business um, through the podcast or by helping them with their marketing, that when they decide to start delegating, like you've said, um, start delegating some of those tasks to other members of their team, or they start maybe hiring other people to take on some of those tasks, almost 100% of the time, their business sees huge growth. Um, 
and and it's 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 a it's a principle that I've been fascinated with as I've done this podcast and and spoke to people like Derek and Katie and you know all the other business owners that I've, I've spoke to almost across the board when you're willing to start delegating some of those tasks to somebody else or train someone or hire someone to help you with some of those tasks almost all of the time you're going to see growth in your business and it's going to help you um, reach more customers and build more revenue it just just whatever it's going to do, but it's going to help you grow your business if you're willing to delegate some of those tasks. And that's super consistent. Go ahead. I have one thing I'd like to add to that because here's a pro there's an inherent problem in what I just told you to do. Um, delegation is important, but you, you bring up a good point. You start bringing people in and then um, take a moment and just write down, put down your your organizational chart. And I don't mean like an organizational chart um, that you're going to show to a consultant. I'm, I'm talking about how it really works, right? Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is it's one of two things. The owner or principal is here and everyone reports to that individual, right? Because I've delegated everything. So everything has to come back to me. And that is a nightmare. You haven't really done a good job of that. Or the other extreme is you look at their organizational chart and it's like, oh, here's the owner and we have a general manager and then I have an operations manager, then I have a branch manager, a mitigation manager, uh, a project manager, a mitigation lead and a mitigation helper. And you're 12 spots from, a mid from the bottom of the pile. Yeah. And now you have no ability to communicate in your organization. It's complete failure. You cannot execute change. How would you communicate a change to in that situation uh, to a helper? Well, if the owner walks down and tells the helper, "Oh, don't be doing that. That's not the way we do it. that." You you have just stomped your whole organizational structure flat. Yeah. What are you doing? Stay out of it. So you really <clears throat> what you really want is you want your organizational char chart to be short and wide, right? So so you want to have like make it your rule to never have more than maybe maybe at most two steps between you and the bottom of the uh, the organizational chart. So in other words, if you're the owner, there can't there could be perhaps a an operations manager and then a tech and then all your all your technicians on the same level. Well, that means there's one step between you and the and the text. That's okay. Because now you're going to communicate to your that that operations manager, and they will communicate to the technicians, and everybody's in the know now. But you add one more step, complication and implementation become very very challenging. So that would be my only caution: don't just hire somebody to do something. You yeah. got bring somebody in. You you got to think about how they fit in and how the communication will work. Otherwise. Nobody knows everything. So you have these massive meetings. Okay, we got to get everybody in here for the weekly meeting. And you got 25 people sitting around for two hours trying to download information because nobody knows everything. Right. And that is, that is rest. You, you have, you've got a mess on your hands. I've been there, been there, done it, learned it from personal experience. Uh, you can't operate that way. Totally agree. That's fabulous. Totally agree. So, hey, if I might. Hey, yeah, go ahead. I have an, I now, I mean, as a alumni, I am, I am a next level alum, two time, two, two time next level alum. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm anxious to hear about uh, what you got going on. What's your, what you and this REITs Drying Academy team of which is a, team of rock stars with maybe the exception of you know meredith or something but the yeah. rest of them are amazing uh what are you putting together for this event that's coming up in in a few weeks well um next what's the premise time, what's the focus i'll start with next level is a labor of love that is that is what it's about because it is a I have put so much work into this. It's a lot. I mean, this is not just uh, something, a, comp, a greatest hits compilation that I'm bringing together. Oh, we've heard all this stuff before. So <sighs> Meredith, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> I, that's not true. I, I just like to say that. Um, 
<laughs> hey, I, both of us. I love to do it as well too, Meredith. Yeah, she is. She is like my little sister, though. So, love her. To yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, but so here's here's the deal. Uh, she comes. It's got to be the best thing you've ever taught, and nobody wants to hear anything you've already said because they've already got that. So we have to have something you've never said before and it'd be the best thing you've ever said. That's a lot harder. It's hard to say, that, but it's a lot harder to actually do that. And, um, and so I, but I took on the challenge and because I wanted the challenge of doing it and um, I am loving it. I mean, I really, I'm going to be, I'm going to be glad to be uh, able to actually have the event and and, and uh, put it out there, but it's focused um, on change. I, I'm trying to think what does the restoration company of 2022 need right now? And so much, so many companies have seen uh, to Hayden's point this exponential growth, um, and there's been just. Uh, uh, so much churn with regard to it, over the last two years with regard to inflation and um, personnel related things and even where we get our business. So many things have changed. It's time, I, I think, to step back and um, look at the principles, the operational principles that we guide our company on and make sure. Now, let's let's reevaluate where we're at based on how we when I say operational principles, I'm not talking about uh I'll be a good person. That, those are values. That's different. Operational principles are, this is how we make a living. This is how we choose to make money here. And, um, you know, you might have an operational principle, like, like one of our operational principle, principles I just mentioned. Our courses will show people uh, how to get paid for the job they should do. Those two things, that's an operational principle that guides the type of courses we're going we're gonna to create. However, um, if you, if you don't write those things down, you tend to drift. And, and, and right now, we need to tighten up. We need to focus and um, remember exactly the core of how we make money as a, as a company. And then um, I, I have this thing. I talked about it in the last Next Level event a little bit. I, was starting, I had started developing this concept of what I call profitable activities. And it's what I have found is that throughout our SOPs or throughout our accomplishing some sort of project, whether it's a mitigation project or fire or mold or whatever, there are certain things that if we do, they, they give us this key opportunity to generate more profit and not and for the right reason, not just to do something that is questionable. Uh oh. Getting a text message, my do not disturb must have gone off. Let me turn it back on. Um, but it, uh, you've talked, I've talked way too long. I apologize. Um, but, no um, but any in, in any case, back on eight, uh, what, what was that you said you had, Derek? Um, uh, but hey, yeah, exactly <laughs> the same thing. Um, but, um, uh, La, la, la. going back to finding these oper key opportunities, just taking time to think about them. And we've generated a lot of uh, these profitable activities that have made a massive impact in our profitability. It helps our technicians to know exactly what they can do to make a difference. And, and even when it goes to things like goals, you know, we set a goal, oh, we want to do, we want to get to this, we want to accomplish that. Goals are the most misunderstood, under overutilized rather, um, most useless thing uh, we have in our toolbox. Now, I'm perhaps overstating that, but the, but the point is if you just go, hey, we're gonna do, you know how we did 100 last year? We're gonna do 200 this year, go team. What changed? Uh, are you <clears throat> work twice as hard this year, we can't do that. That's not possible. You might be able to get away with that once, but you can't do that continually. What you've got to do is go back in and go, what, what are those key opportunities that we could change? And if we did those activities, and the more we do of those activities, and we need to do this, then we're going to get to 
our goal. It, that's the key is you can in your mind go, well, I really want to be here. But don't voice that. You yeah. got to come back and go, <clears throat> how do we get there? We got to change this. Oh, here's a spot where we can make some adjustments. And here's another spot. And here's another spot. And then go, if we made those changes, could that get us there? Yes or no? Or am I going to just come back to everybody and just go, you know how you did so well last year? You know how we had the last meeting and I said, awesome, we got our goals. Well, you got to work harder this year. I mean, that is so, uh, that's not going to encourage that. That is not a motivational speech. Uh, and just in case you're wondering. Um, so, so that's what we're going to talk about is how do we come back and go, you know, these goals become more and more challenging to hit the longer you're in business. You've, it's, it's all about finding those key opportunities to make adjustment. We're going to show you that not only the process for how you can continue, you can work that tool into your business, but also we're going to give you some exact, uh, some very specific profitable activities we're going to share with you. And man, if you can implement two or three or four of those, we're going to give you a, a lot of them. But if you can implement those, fantastic. And what's even, uh, it's going to make a massive impact for you. But um more importantly than just going, here's an idea and there's an idea. I hate courses where it's like that because it's like, you know, you're just entertained. That's it. This cannot be entertainment. Y'all can go to the movie and they're way better than I am. We've yeah. got we've got to bring value. And so we the other premise that we built Next Level on is uh, actions, not just ideas. So throughout, it's like, that's just an idea. Where's the action? And so you'll find throughout the program, we're going to talk about something and then we're going to pause and we're going to say, okay, you have 10 minutes, work with your teams. That's why we're trying to encourage people uh, to bring more than just one person from the company, unless that's all you have, right? But, but bring those decision makers because um, we want to take that information and go, okay, how could we apply that here? And I've got worksheets that are all designed for you to be able to it's fill in the blank. And mm -hmm. you play with putting that together. And it's that that those moments of thought right at that key key time. Just like we talked about the education theory, telling you and then giving you the opportunity to do it. That's it. Right. And then our team is standing right there. If you have any questions, just ask. We don't get it. Tell, tell me what. Here we are. We can help you with that. So you come away with uh, this book that's yours. It's customized solutions that you've produced for your business to be able to come back in and, and bring those in one at a time to help you reach your goals. That's, that's what next level is about. We got to get you to the next level somehow, right? I mean, that's why we call it next level. And so um, I think you're going to like it. I have this beautiful, glossy book that I'm, oh man, I'm going to tell you what, I'm super proud of this thing. <laughs> I really like this thing, man. Well, and I love shiny objects for sure. So yeah. You're going to, I've got shinier one, the better. I've got one that's a little fluffy for a pillow for the plane just for you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, I can't awesome, wait. Jeremy. So tell tell us when this is and where how to if if people are wanting to come. Yeah. Um how do they how do they uh, how do they take advantage of coming to next level? Absolutely. Go to readsdryingacademy.com. readsdryingacademy.com is our website. Our phone number 770 712-7293. The lovely Meredith Truett will answer your phone call, most likely. And um, or the lovely Rebecca Balin or the not so lovely Nick Sharp. One of them, somebody's gonna somebody's gonna answer the phone. Yeah, somebody will answer. <laughs> um, or you can or you can register online. Um, on the 10th, we have golf, and um, then we all in, in the morning. So some people will be coming in for that. That's just kind of like a pre-conference day. Um, but then in the evening, we're one of uh, the most important parts of the event is is the uh, dinner and at the brewery. It's just a great networking event, just to kick everything off. Games, man, you get to talk to people you've seen on Facebook or haven't seen for some time, and so that's a fantastic oppor opportunity. Then August 11th and 12th, and that's at Peachtree City, Georgia. Uh, August 11th and 12th will be the conference. And so it's going to be at a hotel. We have, you know, so you got the rooms, the conference room. It's all right there together. And it's it's a really nice, uh, nice place to to be. So, uh, well, we'd love to have you guys. I mean, it's the more the merrier. That's very cool. You're doing this program once. So if you're not there, you know, 
It's not like a duo, but we're not doing an encore. <laughs> Could you record it? Could you videotape it and record it? I never thought of that. What is this video thing? That I know. You, this what is, is this video? Thing. This is a new thing. For never you. thought of training. Yeah, and write it down, Jeremy. Write it down. That what this does on the back of my phone? I've been trying to figure out what those three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and anticipate change. Yeah. You know I mean? and yeah I've been is, figure it out. Yeah, I know. I know. I just, to think of that. Anything I can do to help you is that's what I'm about. Yeah. That's why I talk to you twice a year. There that's you go. <laughs> twice a year. Jeremy, this has been this has been awesome for us. Um, I think you've you've hit it on the head multiple times and you've said it throughout the podcast, but you're a guy that believes that there's got to be some kind of action. <clears throat> um, a lot of content on the internet is rah-rah work harder, right? Like work twice as hard, go out, you know, all that. And for me, that's just, I just do not buy into that stuff. There's got to be some actionable ideas or plans that we can put into place that will help my business grow or even just myself, like personally grow. And I think that's a hundred percent what next level is going to be. And, and what you guys do at Reach Dragon Academy outside of next level is actual things that people can do and implement in their business to make themselves better, to make their team better, and ultimately, you know, make more money, right? Like actually have a game plan to do so. Yeah, you know, and one closing comment to, to that point there, um, you know, we look at the, at, at times, or maybe still is the most valuable company in the world, Apple, right? So is it that just, I mean, I'm sure they work very hard, no doubt, but you asked Tim Cook, what, what's the key to their success? And he said, um, and I'm paraphrasing, we're the most um, focused company that I know of, that I've ever heard of, and that I think exists. And we do that by saying no to good ideas every day. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that, 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 um, you know, that's, that's a key for, for, for success is you've got so much effort, focus it into one spot and you're going to be amazing at what you do. Awesome. Well, Love that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to take too much more of your time, Jeremy. So we're going to do some rapid fire right here at the end before we, we, we let you go. I, I know you've got a wealth of knowledge here. So three questions. I'm anxious right? for this one. All right, here Red. we go. Red. Yeah, Give me Derek's that. excited Red. for this. Red. Three questions. Oh. First, uh, favorite book or podcast that you're listening or reading to or reading right now, listening to or reading yeah. right now. So um, I will go with book and, okay. uh, because that'll that'll um that's a pretty easy one the four disciplines of execution if you've never read the four disciplines of execution it's amazing amazing four disciplines of x read it and um and just enjoy it but i mean hey that's one of those things where you better get a highlighter and a pen i mean mine is a right. mess but um but do it who wrote it who write who wrote it Jeremy Reeves. Uh, it's I think it's a variety, it's a number of um it's a number of guys that work together. Guys, okay. It was Sean Covey, um uh Chris McChes McChesney. I don't know how that is. I I've never Jim Hewling. So, but anyway, if you look up the four disciplines of execution, you will find it. All right. I've got it written down. I'm looking it up as soon as we're off of this podcast. Love it. Okay. Second question, Jeremy. Um, I know as a business owner throughout your life, you've had to wear a lot of hats. How do you recharge or, or relax at the end of a long day? So I think two things. Number one, um, I'm very close with my family. So family time, but um, you know, to, to get a little outside of just that out outside, I like to get outside. So um, fishing, hunting, riding side by sides. Uh, I work outside pretty much all day, every day. Um, so I am right now we're building a big covered porch on the back of the house because I want another place to be able to work um, that doesn't have bugs at certain times of the year. And it's nice <laughs> to cover and I'll be able to relax. But I have currently have four covered porches. So I move from one to the other. And um, we, uh, I work outside because I, I just like being outside. That's, that's where I enjoy the most. And um, so anyway, that, that's that, awesome. That's 
you uh you and Derek are kindred spirits then uh Derek was talking to me the other day about how nice it is for him to be outside on his porch and work on his porch and sit by the pool and all that fun stuff so yeah is is you're in Dallas right Derek yeah I'm just south south of Dallas yeah Dallas Fort Worth area go outside and I mean I'm sure there's lots of outdoor was it like a tire oh, yeah. or something or what's the deal with that <laughs> what did you say you broke up what did you say <laughs> what what do you look out at when you look out what do you see like a tire plant or yeah. well, i'm sure it's beautiful whatever it is or some cows something like that <laughs> big texas longhorns okay very good that's good enough <clears throat> okay nice final question jeremy um you've uh you've been in the industry for a while now restoration and cleaning as well as <clears throat> the education space as well um if you could rewind to the beginning of it all, whether it's the beginning of Reach Drying Academy or the beginning of uh, your involvement with your family's restoration company, what's one thing that you would tell yourself? Yeah. Invest in Apple stock, probably. Uh, yeah, that's it. Done. Yep. That's exactly. it, done. <laughs> I mean, obviously, that would be fantastic to know and buy all the real estate you can buy in right. 20, 2019. <laughs> but other than that... Um, other than that, um, you know, I, I, I will say, and I think that there may, may be nothing you can do about it, but um, if I could tell myself uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, one thing it would be, uh, don't try to prove what you can do. You know, in other words, I spent a lot, I spent the first 20 years of work trying to prove to myself all the things, oh, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, you can do it. We all know it. If you put your mind to something, you can do it. That's why there's somebody who does everything because they decide, oh, I want to do this. And they figured it out. You can do the same thing. It's not novel. What you got to figure out is what you should be doing and quit doing all the other stuff, right? So you get into a business and, and, and I have people that come to me uh, for school all the time. And they're like, oh, we're starting a business. Oh, okay, well, well, uh, what are you guys gonna be doing? Well, we're gonna do water, fire, mold, pack out, reconstruction. Uh, we're thinking about crawl space encapsulation. Um, I don't, can you think of anything else? Like, dude, you just named out six businesses. Which one are you starting? <laughs> yeah, right? which one are you gonna do? Yeah. And, and, and that's, a, that's a mistake. It's like, can you do it? Absolutely. Will you be amazing at all of it at the same time? Absolutely not. And you'll run yourself in the ground. And, and so, you know, I'll tell you what that meant for me at one point. And of course, it was my parents' company, but we did everything. You name it, we'll do it. Um, but I just realized, man, there's all these things that I don't really like to do and that we don't really are not are a lot less profitable than some of the other stuff we do. And today, all we do is water mitigation. We don't do reconstruction. We don't do mold remediation. We don't do fire. We don't do pack out. We don't do carpet cleaning. We don't do any of that stuff. We don't do board up. We don't chase storms. Why? Well, I mean, we could do all of it. Yeah, absolutely. We've done it all. We could go back to doing it again. But you know what? Uh, we work. A, I work a whole lot less and make a lot more by being focused and being really good at the one thing that we really enjoy doing. And so that would be what I tell people. Yeah, we know you can do it. We trust you. We believe in you. But figure out what you should be doing instead of proving to yourself what you can do. That's awesome. Great. That is great, great advice. Great advice. Great advice. Derek, anything else you want to say to your, your right, best right. friend, Jeremy Reitz, before we kick right him off Right after this here? call, I'm going to go figure that one thing out right now. So <laughs> got, I've got some work. i got some work to put in to figure out what that one thing is. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, you are the man. Just want, I've told you that before. I don't think maybe, that's maybe, I don't think that's a direct maybe, quote from before. Maybe I've told maybe I've told you that. <laughs> I think before. there were a few other words oh. in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, I do I, I respect you. I know you, I, I I value our friendship that we've been able to build over the last gosh, 20 years or so. You are a mentor to me, a good friend and and thank you for the time that you spent today sharing with with our audience and uh and uh, you are, you are a, a, a great friend of mine. So thank you very much.
Hey, and, and I appreciate hearing you say that. I, I, I didn't know we'd have to turn a camera on to get those words to come out of your mouth. But <laughs> whatever it takes, I whatever appreciate it. Takes. Terry, we do what we got to do. Great friend as well. And Hayden, you seem like a pretty nice guy. I just met you a few minutes ago, but you, you, you're you all right, too. Well, I appreciate that. We, uh, we'll have to have you well, up to Idaho. Sign too. That's nice. <laughs> well, you, I, I'll have to have you up. If you like fishing and being outside, Jeremy, you'll have to come up to Idaho and we'll do some fishing or something sometime. Yeah, some fly fishing. You guys do a little fly fishing? Oh, yeah, that's all I do. I'm all over fly fishing, man. We got a house up on a river in, in North Georgia, but we can't fly fish from June to, mm, say, early October. Too well, hot. Then I'll come down to you in the winter and you can come up to me in the summers then. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds very interesting. So I got pictures on my phone. We don't have time, but I'm talking, we got trout, 26, 28-inch trout, and you can catch them all day long. Well, Derek, uh, I will be working remotely from Georgia uh, this <laughs> in coming the fall. winter. So all right. Uh, all right. Fall, don't expect man. to see me all that much. Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> we really appreciate it. And, Jeremy. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank all you, right. guys. This has been Success Elevated making you a little bit better one show at a time. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe on any major podcast platform or check out our website at successonpoint.com.